Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on the circulatory system and substance exchange. Now, before you watch this video, make sure you're confident on osmosis diffusion and active transport and the immune system. I've got videos on both those things earlier in this playlist, should you need. Now, in this video, we will be looking at transport and exchange, maximizing the rate of diffusion, alveoli, the idea of surface area to volume ratio, and then blood, blood vessels, and the heart. Let's start by looking at transport and exchange. Now, we've got this key phrase we often use, which is substance exchange. Now, this is the process by which the things our cells need enter them and that their waste products leave them. So there are a range of different substances that our cells need and they must be transported to our cells in the blood and then they enter the cells. Now the kind of things our cells need are oxygen, mineral ions, food molecules and water and those must all be transported to the cells in the blood before they can then enter the cells. There are also various waste products that our uh, cells produce that must be carried away. Two good examples of that are carbon dioxide and urea. And so again, they will leave the cell and then go into the blood where they're carried away and disposed of. It is the job of the circulatory system to do that transporting, to bring the substances we need to our cells and to carry the waste away from our cells. Now, most substance exchange in the body occurs by diffusion. So many parts of our body are adapted in ways that will maximize the rate of diffusion. We can do this in a few ways. Um, this is done by increasing the surface area. So giving something a high surface area, this means there's more space for particles to diffuse into the cells. So if we look at this structure of the small intestine here, we can see all these sort of little wiggles really increase the surface area, which make it much easier and faster these blue molecules to diffuse um, through and into the blood. The next thing is that we ensure there is a good blood supply. What that does is it means that once the blue particles here enter our blood, they're quickly carried away rather than building up in the blood. And what that does is it keeps a high concentration gradient, which ensures that the rate of diffusion remains fast. And lastly, we have thin membranes. Um, that means that there is a shorter distance for the particles to diffuse, which again speeds up the rate of diffusion. Now we can see all of those adaptations for maximizing diffusion uh, in the alveoli in our lungs. Now our lungs contain millions of these tiny air sacs, which we call alveoli. We can see that here. So we see the way that you know, the air comes down our windpipe. It separates into our two bronchi and then we have all these narrow tubes in our lungs that branch off into smaller and smaller branches until they end in these little sacs called alveoli. Now those are actually much, much bigger than they would really be. Um, there are millions of these alveoli, about 240 million in each lung. Okay. Now the alveoli are the site of gas exchange in the lungs. So in the alveoli, oxygen diffuses from the air into the blood and equally, carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood into the air. Now, how are alveoli adapted to maximize the rate of diffusion? Well, they've got a large surface area. Any individual one has a very small surface area, but there are millions and millions of them, which gives the lungs a massive surface area for diffusion. If you were to lay out all of the surfaces inside our lungs, it would cover the area approximately of a tennis court. They have a very good blood supply. So every alveolus is wrapped in one of these capillaries that you can see wrapping around the outside of it there. That gives it a good blood supply to bring the carbon dioxide quickly to it and also to carry the oxygen away quickly from it. And the last thing is they've got very thin membranes. Look how thin these membranes there and there are. And that means that the gases do not have far to diffuse. Uh, they can get in and out of the alveolus very, very quickly. OK, so we've seen that the surface area is super important in terms of maximizing the rate of diffusion. But actually what's more important isn't so much the surface area as the surface area compared to its volume. So the greater the surface area compared to the volume, the more rapidly the substances it needs can enter and leave it. 
and we express this quantitatively with the surface area to volume ratio which is found simply by dividing the surface area by the volume and we'll work through a few examples of that now so let's imagine we've got a small cube um, where its height width and um, depth are all one centimeter well the surface area of that is going to be each square each face is a square so there there will be surface area will be will be one multiplied by one there are six faces so multiply by six and we get six centimeters squared as our uh, surface area for that cube now the volume will be because it's a cube base times height times depth so one times one times one to give me one centimeter cubed and so my surface area to volume ratio will just be my surface area six divided by my volume which is one and that gives me an answer a surface area to volume ratio of six what about a slightly bigger cube this time my 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 width my height and my depth are going to be two centimeters so this time when we calculate the surface area remember each face is a square so the area of each face is two multiplied by two and then there are six faces so i multiply by six again and that will give me a surface area of 24 centimeters squared my volume remember it, it is a cube so the volume of a cube base times height times depth so two multiplied by two multiplied by two two times two is four times two again is eight centimeters cubed so now my surface area to volume ratio is going to be my surface area 24 centimeters squared divided by my volume 8 centimeters cubed and that will give me a surface area to volume ratio of 3 so let's look at one last example our biggest cube now this cube has sides of 3 centimeters so therefore for my surface area remember again each each face is a square so the area of those will be 3 multiplied by 3 and there are six faces um, so multiply by six three times three is nine times six is a surface area of 54 centimeters squared next we have the volume remember the volume of a cube is the base times the height times the depth so three multiplied by three multiplied by three three times three is nine times three gives us a uh, volume of 27 centimeters cubed and so finally to calculate my surface area to volume ratio we are going to do the surface area 54 centimeters squared divided by my volume 27 centimeters cubed and that gives me a surface area to volume ratio of two so what we see very clearly here is as that cube gets bigger and bigger the surface area to volume ratio gets smaller and smaller which would make it harder and harder for enough substances to diffuse in or out of it quickly enough which is why we tend to maximize the surface area to volume ratio so that we can get the substances that we need quickly enough now we've seen already that the substances our cells need are transported um, to them by the blood so understanding about the structure of blood is really important now what is blood what's its, what's its purpose the purpose of blood is two things firstly to transport oxygen and nutrients to our cells and also to carry carbon dioxide and other waste such as urea away from our cells now there are four different components of blood so if we were to get a test tube of blood and to separate it out we'd see it would form these four different layers that would look like this now that that top layer is a substance called plasma and that makes up 55 percent of the blood now this is the liquid part of the blood and it suspends the blood cells so that they can actually flow around the body like a liquid so the plasma is the liquid part of the blood it suspends the blood cells so that they can flow and also it transports dissolved carbon dioxide and nutrients as well next making up about 45 percent of the volume of the blood we have our red blood cells and their job is simply and only to transport oxygen around the body then a very very small fraction of the blood is our white blood cells it's much less than one percent and their job is to destroy or to kill 
pathogens. So the white blood cells are a major part of our immune system. And then finally, the last bit of the blood, also significantly less than 1%, is what we call platelets. Now, these are sort of tiny fragments of old cells, uh, oh, so tiny fragments of cells, and their job is to clot the blood so that when we bleed, because uh, we're injured or something, we will stop bleeding because of the work of the platelets. So let's look at the red blood cells and the platelets in a little bit more detail. Now, our red blood cells, also known as erythrocytes, their job is to transport oxygen, and they've got a number of adaptations to enable them to do that more effectively. So adaptation number one is that they contain a protein called hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin binds reversibly to oxygen. So when our um, when the blood is flowing around our lungs, oxygen diffuses into the blood and hemoglobin combines with the oxygen in the lungs to form a compound called oxyhemoglobin. Now, this is a reversible process. So as the blood travels around the body, the oxyhemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin converts back to hemoglobin and releases the oxygen for our cells to use. Now, the second adaptation is that red blood cells are the only cells in our body that have no nucleus. And this just means that they have a greater space available, more volume inside them for carrying hemoglobin so that they can transport more oxygen. And the last important adaptation is they've got what we call a biconcave disc shape. So if you were to slice through one, it would look like this, a bit like a, you know, a discus or something like that. Um, and that gives them a much higher surface area to volume ratio so that, so that they can absorb and release their oxygen more quickly. What about our platelets? Now, the job of platelets is to clot the blood, and they've got a couple of adaptations that allow them to do that. The first thing is they can have proteins on their surface that stick to breaks in the blood vessels. So when we cut ourselves, blood vessels get broken and the platelets will stick to those breaks. Then what they do is they secrete proteins that will cause the blood to clot, forming a scab so that the blood stops leaking out um, and uh, we can then start the healing process. What about white blood cells? So white blood cells, there are two main kinds. We have lymphocytes. Um, their job is to produce antibodies which will destroy pathogens. We can see that here, right? So these, these uh, chemicals, these Y-shaped chemicals, uh, on the or uh, on the surface of the lymphocytes, they stick to the antigens, these things that are on the surface of the pathogen, and that will help to destroy it. Um, so once a lymphocyte gets activated, it produces lots of copies of itself to make huge amounts of antibodies to quickly destroy all of those pathogens. Um, do check out the video on uh, the immune system uh, for more detail on this. We've also got phagocytes. Now, phagocytes, their job is to engulf and digest pathogens. And you can see that happening here, right? So um, if we look at the phagocyte, you know, comparing the two cells, lymphocytes have got these antibodies on them, but phagocytes have got this really kind of big blobby shape. Lymphocytes have got a small regular nucleus, whereas phagocytes have got this kind of big blobby looking nucleus there. Now, phagocytes also have on them these projections which we call pseudopods. You don't need that word, but it's a nice word. So I thought I'd put it in pseudopods. And now what these pseudopods do is they engulf around the pathogen and eventually completely encircle it. And then they inject the pathogen with enzymes which will digest it and destroy that pathogen. The next thing to look at is the structure of the different kinds of blood vessel that carry that blood around the body. Now, the first kind of blood vessel we need to know about is the arteries. Now, the role of arteries is to carry blood away from the heart. Now, to remember that, we put the A in arteries with the A in away. Now, they have several adaptations that allow them to do this job effectively. First is they've got these thick muscle walls. We can see that here. See how thick the wall is there? And that allows them to withstand the high blood pressure of that blood being pumped by the heart away from it. They've also got elastic walls that can stretch as the blood pressure increases with each heartbeat. Um, and that's what we feel is the pulse. That pulse is the blood vessel temporarily expanding um, due to those elastic fibres when there's each heartbeat. And the last adaptation is they've got a narrow lumen. So the internal 
uh, size of the blood vessels are very small um, and that's because blood is moving quickly so it doesn't need to be um, a wide lumen. Now the next type of blood vessel is capillaries. Now capillaries are where substance exchange happens. So this is where the oxygen and glucose and nutrients leave the blood and go into our cells and where the carbon dioxide, urea and other waste leaves the cells and goes into the blood. In terms of adaptations, it's all of the adaptations we've talked about earlier for maximizing the rate of diffusion. So they have thin walls to minimize the distance to increase the rate of diffusion. We have a huge number of them, thousands of kilometers of these very tiny uh, blood vessels that gives them a big surface area to maximize the rate of diffusion as well. The final blood vessel we've got is the veins and these carry blood back towards the heart. Again, they've got a few different adaptations. The first thing is they've got much thinner walls this time. This is because the blood is at low pressure, so they don't need to have the same strength that arteries do. Second is we have a wide lumen, and that's because they've got to accommodate a greater volume of blood because the blood's moving much more slowly. And lastly, we've got these valves. Um, you can see the valves there and there, and they are there to prevent the, the backflow of blood because the blood's got very low pressure at this point. So there's really nothing pushing it forwards. So we have these valves to prevent it from flowing backwards. Now that we've seen the structure of the blood and we know about the different blood vessels, we're going to see how it all comes together with the heart and how the heart gets that blood to circulate around the body. Now we're going to take a diagrammatic approach to this. So this is not what the circulatory system actually looks like, but it's a simplified version to help you get your head around it. We'll look at a slightly more realistic one on the next slide. So first thing to say is that our heart is a double pump, and I'm going to draw it just as a rectangle like you can see there. Now, I say double pump because there are two sides to the heart. There's a right side, and it pumps blood up to the lungs. And there is a left side, which pumps blood around to the body. Now you'll notice that the right and left on the diagram are the wrong way round. Um, the reason for that is because if you can imagine picking that diagram up on a sheet of paper and then placing it over your own heart, suddenly the left and the right sides would line up properly. Now, we've got a left and a right side of our heart and on each side there are two chambers. There is an atrium, which is the top chamber, and a ventricle, which is the bottom chamber. So we have a right atrium and a right ventricle, a left atrium and a left ventricle. In between each of our two uh, chambers, in between the atrium and the ventricle on each side, we've got valves. Now valves are there to prevent the backflow of blood. So the blood can flow downwards through the valve, but it cannot go back upwards against the valve. Uh, and that ensures that the blood just flows in one direction around the circulatory system. Now, blood will enter the right atrium from the body through the vena cava. Now, I'm drawing the blood blue at this point to represent the idea that it is low in oxygen concentration because it's been around the body and given the oxygen to all of the cells. It's also high in carbon dioxide concentration because it's taken that waste carbon dioxide away from the cells. Now, what will happen next is that the right atrium will contract and the blood will be passed through the valves from the right atrium to the right ventricle. What happens next is the right ventricle contracts and blood is forced out of a big vein called the pulmonary vein where it's going to travel to the lungs. So this word pulmonary just means kind of to do with the lungs. So the pulmonary artery is carrying blood away from the heart, because that's what arteries do, towards the lungs. Now, in the lungs, the blood is going to lose its carbon dioxide and gain a whole load more oxygen that it's going to distribute to the rest of the body as it continues its onwards journey. Now, you might well imagine to get from the lungs back to the heart, the blood is going to travel through another vein, and this time it's the pulmonary vein, and so it travels from the lungs through the pulmonary vein into the left atrium of the heart. The left atrium will contract 
and blood will pass through its valve into the left ventricle. The left ventricle will then give it an almighty squeeze and send it under very high pressure through an, uh, a really big artery, maybe our most important artery called the aorta, and it will leave the left ventricle through the, aor through the aorta to go to the rest of the body. And as it does that, it will distribute all that oxygen that it's just gained from the lungs and carry away the carbon dioxide that it's taking as waste from the cells and eventually gets back to the vena cava and goes back round one more whole lap into the right atrium, into the right ventricle, through the pulmonary artery to the lungs, through the pulmonary vein to the left atrium, through the valve into the left ventricle and it just goes round and round and round again. Now you can well imagine that because the um, left ventricle is having to pump blood so much further than the right ventricle is pumping it all around the body rather than just going to the lungs and back. That means the left ventricle has to be much stronger, which is why the left ventricle has really thick muscle wall compared to the right ventricle. OK, so that is the, the heart shown in kind of diagrammatic form. What we'll try and do now is a, a slightly more realistic one that is a bit closer to what you might see in an exam uh, to help you see how, how this diagram applies to the kind of real world. So here is our heart, but more realistic. So you can see all the different features we were just talking about. So in the real heart, it looks something like this. Okay. So our right, uh, our, our vena cava rather, uh, is at the top here. So you can see the blood is entering there through there from the body. It's going into our right atrium, through the valve, and into the right ventricle. Then it's going to go up and out of the heart through the pulmonary artery towards the lungs. In the lungs, it's going to lose carbon dioxide, gain oxygen, and come back into the left atrium through the pulmonary vein. And here's our left atrium just there. Um, from the left atrium, it will go through that valve into the left ventricle. The left ventricle gives it an almighty squeeze and it goes out of the body through the aorta, so out of the um, heart through the aorta towards the rest of the body. Now, you remember on the last slide I said about how the wall of the left ventricle is much thicker than the right ventricle. And that's super important because it has to be really strong muscle to give it a very forceful push to get that, body blood, to get that blood around the whole body rather than just going to the lungs and back. Okay, so that's it, the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.